from the chronically green state of Oregon. It's new skeptics. Raphael Lataster, Jesus did not exist. How are you doing, Raphael Lataster? I'm doing uh, very well, thanks, Phil. And that was a very impressive introduction. I guess you could work as one of those trailer people. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would that would the only part I don't like about that is the work. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay, but you now you've been very busy lately. Yes, I have. I have had a, a crazy year last year with regards to publishing articles and of course the the book Jesus did not exist with uh, with carrier and also with regards to teaching my um, career is is progressing despite uh, despite expectations despite the low expectations <laughs> my, my career is uh, is slowly getting there I won a teaching award last year at the University of Sydney and uh, that in turn helped me win uh, a teaching fellowship so now I'm a teaching fellow with the university in, uh, in studies, studies in religion. Excellent. So, I had, <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, I had to co uh, correct David Fitzgerald a little earlier today. He was calling you Dr. Lataster, and I thought that was a bit premature. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair enough. Uh, it's, it's not far off. I'm, I'm lecturing and, and, and researching at a major university, but yeah, I don't have the PhD yet. That will hopefully be later in the year because uh, that, that is wrapping up and everything is looking quite positive positive right now. So, uh, yeah, soon I will have the PhD. I'm already lecturing. I'm in studies in religion. There's, there should be no question over, over my uh, credentials. And, in fact, I've got many articles already published on this and related, related topics in proper peer-reviewed journals, in publications uh, by Cambridge University Press and Springer and, and major major publishers like that. So, yeah, I don't think there can be any question now of uh, of um, credibility. Okay, indeed you do. Did you ever uh, study someone named Frankie Reynolds in uh, in religious studies? Uh, he used to write on Buddhism, I guess, a lot. No, I'm not familiar. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Let's let's get on to. Uh, uh, your interview now. Did you uh, do your PhD on William Lane Craig? By the way, yes, that okay, is because uh, that is something quite close to my heart. He's considered uh, yeah. one of the best uh, Christian debaters in the world. I tend to think of him as a master debater uh, occasionally. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> he is a cunning linguist. I I rate him right up there as uh, <laughs> okay. as the best. He's my favorite. He's my icon. Um, I had him sign my copy of, I think it was On Guard, if not Reasonable Faith. I had him sign it to my number one atheist fan. I, uh, <laughs> I do enjoy watching, watching his debate, watching his debates. And yeah, I've dedicated the last what, four to five years of my life to tearing apart his case in multiple ways. Um, I hyperbolically advertise it as in 50 billion different ways, and that's actually true when you look at some of the arguments I have. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's a lot wrong with, with William Lane Craig's case, and I'll, I'll be publishing on that uh, quite soon with the PhD wrapping up and then working on a book after that. We'll have a lot of time to talk about that, and hopefully he will accept my uh, invitation to debate. There's already a group in America willing to willing to make it happen it just relies on Craig to say uh, to finally say yes let's do this okay great glad to hear it um, I've been looking now uh, you know R Richard Carrier's book is also coming up as a topic whenever I discuss you I end up discussing uh, Richard as well yeah, and sure. I, I, I know you've recently come under some criticism but I've seen James McGrath criticizing Richard Carrier's work uh, and his book on the historicity of Jesus and um, it just seems to me like uh, McGrath is totally off the wall, and I'm wondering if that's what you're getting for your critics as as well. Yeah, um, people like McGrath, they're not even worth talking about, really. Uh, I, I read some of the blogs he blog posts he wrote about um, about these theories, about these theories about the celestial Jesus, and when it comes to the Paul's passage, I think it's in Romans about Jesus being crucified by the sky demons. His response was, what? That's it. This one word 
<laughs> so the response of what he's completely he seems completely ignorant that many mainstream scholars do indeed think paul is talking about jesus being killed by the sky demons by the archons because that's how he talks about the archons a lot of the time as, as sky demons and even some christian scholars believe that to be the case so mcgrath is just he's someone that i think is not worth not worth talking about. The only reason we sometimes talk about him is because he's one of the few that's actually saying something about the topic. Uh, but of course, he didn't get the memo. He is a Christian. And if you read right. the subtitle of my book, <laughs> the way it's framed, it's Jesus did not exist, a debate among atheists. I really don't have any interest, and, and there's many more reasons for that, of discussing Jesus' historicity with people that believe in the Christ of faith. We are here to discuss the historical Jesus, the atheist version of Jesus. We all agree that the Christ of faith is a fiction. Right. And when, you, when I hear him, I just I get a primal urge to hurl feces, you know. So right. uh, yes. anyway, okay, now um, with Ehrman in your book, you, you bring him out right at the beginning, and you talk about how he uses hypothetical sources. Um, yeah. his, he thinks the Gospels are good for historicity, but error prone otherwise, <laughs> it seems. Yep. Yep. And, it's and so he, a double standard, it seems to be applied. Yeah, it's very strange. And that's how uh, I link it all to this idea of the hypothetical sources. If you read Ehrman's case for Jesus, which, which I think is quite a poor case, as, as they all are, that's, that's the problem. That's what's leading me down this path of thinking that Jesus did not exist. Um, Ehrman's case, it, it kind of admits that all the sources are bad. Like he, 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 he and Casey and other scholars saying something about this, they kind of admit that all the sources are, uh, are pretty unreliable. For example, the non-biblical sources, there's generally a consensus that we can pretty much ignore them because there's a lot of questions over the authenticity and ambiguity. But even if authentic, even if about the historical Jesus, they don't really tell us anything more than, than what we get from the Gospels. So you wipe them out and then you focus on the biblical sources. And then you, you realize, okay, Paul doesn't seem to say much about Jesus. Uh, and, and the likes of Carrie and myself would say, well, he actually says nothing about the historical Jesus. He doesn't believe in historical Jesus. But um, the, even the mainstream scholars admit that, yes, there is a, 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 big, um, a big lack of information of the historical Jesus, of the gospel Jesus in Paul's writings. So you can pretty much end, at least in their mind, Paul comes after the gospels. While he, he gives us the, the earliest Christian documents, he's uh, apparently in their mind, in the mainstream scholars' minds, he is writing about things that occur after Jesus' story as portrayed in the Gospels. So we can pretty much overlook Paul for now, and then we just have the Gospels. Now, the Gospels, the mainstream scholars even admit that the Gospels are terrible sources. And Ehrman himself says these are not the sources that we would want when we're looking at these sort of uh, historical investigations. So the problem then is, well, you've spent your whole career, you've spent decades demolishing the Gospels, telling us that these are not good sources, and yet now when it comes to the historicity of Jesus, suddenly they're good enough for that. So I'm thinking, well, how do you do that? And the reason, the, the, the reason they can do this is because of the appeal to hypothetical sources. Ehrman uh, and, and Casey, to, to some extent also, uh, brings up the issue of sources behind the Gospels that somehow give credibility to the Gospels. How it does that is left unexplained. I mean, all the problems we have with the Gospels... <laughs> The fact that we don't know who wrote them, the fact that we don't know why they wrote them, except for it's obviously for evangelistic purposes, theological purposes, uh, all the problems with them, the implausible claims, both uh, supernatural and mundane. Right, a contamination, have, a contamination principle, right, yes. as, as Avalos and Law have pointed out. Exactly. All, all these problems also apply to the hypothetical sources that are apparently behind them, and even to a greater extent, because we don't even have the hypothetical sources <laughs> to, to, to verify all this. And I take it even further and say, look, by Ehrman's own words, he admits that these hypothetical sources actually contain fictions. How then are you supposed to go through the hypothetical sources, which we don't even have, to sort out what's true and what's not true? It can't be done. It's just, it's absurd. It is absolutely absurd and it's inconsistent because why are the mainstream historical Jesus scholars allowed to posit hypothetical sources that confirm their views and yet Christians aren't allowed to do the same? You could do the same thing and I think Craig and, and other apologists do this to some extent. They, they say, look, there's all this evidence for the resurrection. We just don't have the evidence anymore. But it did exist at some stage. <laughs> we, have, 
we have loads of hypothetical sources for the resurrection. And also, why not, um, why not historical Jesus agnostics and mythicists? Why, why can't the likes of, say, Carrie and myself posit hypothetical sources, such as that Paul or Peter, th there's a missing document there that admits, yes, this is a, a figure that's purely in the sky. This is a figure that purely, uh, that, that never was on Earth. Or even this is something we just completely made up right now. I mean, there could be such a source. So why is it that only the likes of Ehrman can invent these hypothetical sources? It doesn't make sense. It also draws away attention from actual sources that we know are influences on the Gospels. We know, for instance, the, the influence of, of uh, Greek epics, the influence of the Old Testament, the influence, uh, the influence of the intertestamental literature. These are sources that we actually have. And it's right. obvious that there are, there, are, there are influences here on, say, the Gospel of Mark. So why do we need to posit hypothetical sources that we don't have and can't check when there's all these other sources especially the intertestamental literature, wow, would, that would change the field if everyone knew a lot more about the intertestamental literature. Uh, we have all these sources that we actually can check and that are obvious influences on the Gospels. So it's just, from start to finish, it's just an absurd approach. And part of my argument is that no one else does this. You find no other field in history where hypothetical sources are appealed to, to this extent. I mean, hypothetical sources are posited, uh, but, but they're never used in the way um, that the likes of Ehrman use them. They, they never used to say, therefore, this definitely happened because of a source that doesn't exist. You know, we never see that. It's only when it comes to the historical Jesus. And I, um, I actually prepared a paper on this topic alone, and it was very well received. It was rejected by um, a biblical studies organization, as you'd expect, but it was accepted by a proper history association, and it was very well received. The only person that disagreed with me turned out to be a Christian, uh, and a sociologist rather than a historian, and they went back on their promise to give me um, references, to give me evidence that it is a good approach. So oh <laughs> it was a very, very, uh, very well received paper. I'm working on it as a, as a proper article for a, a proper peer reviewed journal, and we'll see how that turns out. But it, it at least got out there in a proper history seminar, and it was quite well received. Yes, I see. Now, and what gets me about it, when I look at the Gospels especially, that you're, they're using all kinds of, of devices, literary devices, and it's as if the uh, uh, Christian scholarship side ignores every literary device that's going on, including that, that Jesus is a symbolic figure to begin with. Yes, we, we definitely need uh, more honesty there to admit that we just we just don't know. There's so many uncertainties here. Uh, it really is a big deal that we don't know who the authors are. Uh, and, and it's also a big deal, I believe this is something you wanted to speak about, that <clears throat> the Gospels are the later documents, and they seem to derive uh, a lot from the first Gospel, Mark, which raises questions as to other sources. Why do they rely on Mark so much if there were all these other sources floating about? Uh, they seem to rely <laughs> a lot on, on Mark. And Mark, more and more scholars are thinking that Mark is an allegorization of Paul's of Paul's writings. I was going to ask you about that. Why do we yeah. think Mark is allegorizing Paul? Why do we think Mark is allegorizing Paul? Right. Well, there's there's a lot of uh, similarities. I mean, by by necessity, there'd have to be uh, a lot of similarities between uh, Mark's gospel and the writings of Paul. Uh, simply because <clears throat> Mark is the first gospel and the first to really talk about a gospel Jesus. So it, it has a different story. While Paul's writings uh, are, are, the, uh, are the earliest epistles and the earliest Christian writings in general. And there are, there are uh, quite a few similarities uh, between the two. For instance, the, the portrayal, the portrayal of, of Jesus as the new Adam. You get that. You get that a bit in Mark. You definitely get that in Paul in, in one Corinthians fifteen. Uh, that's a common theme. A another common theme is the um, the tolerance of Gentiles. That is another a, a big factor here. And also, I was just um, I was just pondering this earlier. Uh, the power of Jesus over demons. That's obviously a, a big big factor in Paul, it seems in Paul's view, I think it was in yes. Romans 8, in Paul's view, uh, Jesus, and, and a few other passages as well, Jesus defeated the sky demons by being killed by them, 
they, they were unaware of who he really was and that his death would result in salvation for humanity and, and the defeat of the demons. And we, we get, we get uh, hints of that in Mark's writings as well, Jesus' power over the demons, such as with the exorcisms. So there's definitely a few instances. Also, the, uh, the criticism of the likes of Peter, um, that, that is something we see as well similar in, in, in both. And in fact, it's taken to, to an even greater extent in Mark, where we have criticism over Jesus' relatives. Of course, we don't really think that in Paul because <laughs> we think of Paul as uh, Paul's Jesus as not having uh, so many earthly relatives because he's not an earthly being. But we right. have that as well. It seems to be a criticism of, say, early followers of Jesus or people close to Jesus. So th there's a lot of similarities there. And when you look at the, the timing, you know, if one's influencing the other, and there has to be, there has to be influence going on here. If one's influencing the other, why assume that Paul is being influenced by Mark? That really makes no sense. That gives too much, um, that gives too much privilege to traditional Christian views. If, if we think critically, the earliest writings are Paul's writings. So we have to entertain the notion that, okay, maybe the Gospels, since they are the later documents, maybe they're giving us later versions of the story. Right, so just is, because the Gospels, yeah. Okay, I was going to say, especially John, for instance, which is thought to be the latest yeah. of, of them. Yeah. Now, let me ask you about this because the Paul's words wording it, it can be problematic for both sides. But the you mentioned that the word Paul uses for born can also be made when he's referencing Jesus. Yes, yes, that that's exactly right. So this, um, I, I, are you speaking? Are you talking about Galatians four four? Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about, Ralph. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah a, a lot of these passages. Um, I think so. Woman, yes, I think yes, I am. In fact, right, born of yeah, woman, made, uh, made of flesh. These sort of things. They're actually ambiguous. They can work on multiple theories. So it is not good evidence for for. Okay, um, I wasn't believing. talking about four four. I'm talking about that in another question I had prepared, but that's all right. Uh, yeah, because yeah. four four is about the born of woman, which is a strange. Thing to say anybody because it's obvious <laughs> for any regular yeah. person there yeah. there were really no very few c sections back in those days okay yeah, very well, that's few, still uh, being that's still being born of a woman isn't it, it it's a different kind uh, of birth, but that's still that's still being born of a woman you're exactly right i well, mean everyone is born it, of a woman what what kind of a thing in, to say yeah. is this it's like right, saying it oh like Oh, pilot, oh, he don't... was an oxygen breather. What is the point of saying that? Uh, exactly. Yeah. Oh, oh uh, um, Phil likes, uh, Phil drinks water on occasion. So why would you say these things? This is obvious. I mean, of course, of course, if Jesus was a, was a historical figure, he would have been born of a woman. So th right. there seems to be something else to it. It's something that's really weird to say. So maybe there's a theological meaning behind it. Maybe there's, a, there's some sort of allegory going on here. Uh, same as with, I mean, familiar relationships in general in, in New Testament texts, especially in Paul's text. I mean, they do seem to be non-literal. I mean, um, people, uh, everyday believers are brothers and sisters in Christ, although they're not literally Jesus' brothers and sisters. So we do have this ambiguous and theological language throughout Paul. So it wouldn't be surprising if it's, if it's not intended to be literal. But also there's the, the issue that, and, and, I, and I discussed this in Jesus Did Not Exist, the issue that this could indeed be uh, interpolations. I mean, even even Ehrman acknowledges that, say, with the book of Galatians, it's been tampered by later Christians who are trying to combat uh, the Marcionites and the Docetists, uh, people that, that had very, very different views of Jesus, that he wasn't a, a fleshly being, for example. So right. when we have this tampering going on, it makes us think, gee, verses that try and make it a bit more obvious that Jesus might be an earthly figure, Maybe they are indeed interpolations. And when you go through the writings of, uh, of the early church fathers, even those who are arguing against, you know, Marcy and another so-called heretics, you think, well, why aren't they talking about these verses? Did those verses not exist back then? Uh, like I go through, um, through Galatians, for example, and talk about the whole brother of the Lord right. issue. Now, right. you know, there seems uh, to be a lack of early thing. to this. 
Okay, you're breaking up a little bit. That's all right. We'll just continue. Um, okay, now Jacob is named Israel and after defeating Yahweh at wrestling. And uh, Jesus is given a name above all others. And I know that Philo right. considered Jesus microcosmic Israel. The new name Jacob is given by Jehovah. Okay, so uh, it seems that uh, Midrashic allegory uh, goes this way in the ta Tanakh, and then that, that tradition is continued in the New Testament. That you have a person yeah. symbolizing a country, that sort of thing, an image, whereas in fact Jesus is symbolizing Israel in the microcosm, or and even to some extent Jehovah in the fallen temple. Uh, that's a scene as kind of all the same thing, uh, going it, down it in is, flames. It is very interesting. Um, we, we do talk a bit about that in Jesus did not exist, the, the issue of uh, punny names. It does seem to be quite a coincidence that here is this figure that's a savior figure sent by, sent by God, sent by Yahweh, whose name happens to be Yahweh saves. Right. That, just, that just surely has to send uh, alarm bells ringing. <laughs> and you've also got, uh, at least in the Gospels, you've got the, uh, the treacherous disciple and apostle, um, Judas, whose name you know, is Judah, the Jew, whose name happens to be the Jew, when the whole point of the story is that the Jews you know, rejected and betrayed Jesus. So it just seems exactly <laughs> this is beyond coincidence. This is, this is completely manufactured. Yeah. Right. Okay, now let me talk about some of the mystical stuff, the mysterion and mystery cult aspects of Christianity. Yeah. Um, now there's a correlation of terms between Philo of Alexandria and Paul. Uh, it seems to me, for instance, I believe in a kind of uh, Philonic uh, Jesus who isn't like an archetype. He's being presented as a as mm -hmm. a symbolic figure. Yeah. He definitely seems to be a, an intermediary figure in both uh, in both Philo Philo's discussions of the Logos. Yeah, and, and as uh, as less less Christ. than as something less than Jehovah, also initially. It yeah, seems something like. something that's a, a being that has been created by by God, but still a very important being, still a, a divine being, just not the divine being, which right. gets to uh, one of the big fallacious criticisms against this idea is that um, the early Christians wouldn't have seen Jesus as, as God. Well, they didn't. <laughs> In our idea, we're not saying that Jesus was seen as God. He was seen as a divine being, like an angel, perhaps the most important of the angels, the archangel. And there are, there are links to, um, to, uh, to Michael, the archangel, and Jesus, and also Lucifer, who was the archangel, and, and Jesus. There were, there were various groups of earlier Christians that thought that Lucifer was indeed, um, may have been Jesus, and was indeed the good character, while the Old Testament Yahweh was, was basically the devil. Ah, yes, I've, I've heard of that with some of the Gnostics, uh, mm -hmm. as I understand. Okay, now, uh, what will the response of scholars be to your work? What, what, what response do you expect? Or of people generally. Well, it's uh, it's it's hard to tell right now because there's um, the problem is that the people most interested in it, scholars, uh, would probably be biblical studies scholars who wouldn't even bother bother looking at it. <laughs> they, they'll just dismiss <laughs> it offhand because they know that the the case has been poorly presented in the past. And also because it, it really doesn't help their case if it turns out to be true, because obviously uh, biblical scholars tend to need a historical Jesus to, to be relevant and to be funded. Um, so <laughs> the people that would probably agree are people that really would have little interest in looking at it. Having said that, I have got quite a bit of support from my own field of religious studies, which is a bit of a different field from biblical studies. I think we are a bit more objective and uh, a bit more knowledgeable about other other religious traditions. So it's easier for us, I mean, this is a comparative religion, it's easier for us to say, ah, Christianity has borrowed this from, from that religion and from this religion and so forth. Um, and, and Judaism has, has done the same from various pagan religions and, and uh, Mesopotamian religions and so forth. And the response from religious studies scholars in general, I think, ha has been much, uh, has been quite positive. We've got Avalos, of course, who was quite supportive, and I think he sort of uh, identifies as a historical Jesus agnostic. 
Uh, I've had a few, a few scholarly reviews, positive uh, about my first effort, There Was No Jesus, There Is No God, which is a lot more uh, of a popular book. This, this more recent book is more scholarly and is filled with references, Jesus Did Not Exist. But even that popular book was, um, was well received by the scholars that actually reviewed it. <laughs> one, yes. one, scholar, one scholar was um, cautiously supportive of it and one was outright saying, yeah, I think, I think Raphael is, is pretty much right on the money here. And I've also had a colleague, a religious studies colleague, just make an offhanded remark in an article, um, I think dealing with feminist, feminist ideas in early Christianity, uh, in the study of early, early Christian documents. And they just threw in there um, talking about the time frame of Jesus and then just throwing in there in brackets if he existed at all. This is a, a religious studies colleague. Um, so it's just, and a few other religious studies colleagues, colleagues and even historians have come up to me and told me, yeah, they think it's, a, it, it's definitely a, a decent idea, a plausible idea that Jesus didn't exist. So it's something that's, um, that's a bit more palatable to people, I think, outside of New Testament research. And that brings up this, this weird scenario, this, this paradox of sorts, that the people you'd expect to be the real experts on this topic uh, they're probably the people you don't want to consult when it comes to the historicity of Jesus. They have too much vested in, in, in the idea. You want to consult with historians and religious studies scholars like Aria, like myself, that aren't, so, that, that aren't so tied to the notion of historical Jesus. Nor are we tied, and this, this is worth stressing, we are not tied to the idea of Jesus' non-existence. We don't really care. It doesn't bother. <laughs> right. Yes, yes, we're atheists, and, and a lot of our work may be perceived to undermine Christianity, but we don't need Jesus' non-existence to do that. In fact, I'm quite open about saying, I kind of wish there was a historical Jesus, and we, we had good evidence for them. That would be much more damaging to Christianity than the lack of sources we currently have. If okay, we had so sources. You, let me ask this. Then do you don't see the historical Jesus as a sort of anchor for faith that... Uh, people use? Oh, most certainly not. I think it's so disingenuous. If we're going to talk about critics of mine, uh, forget McGraw, we can talk about John Dixon uh, with his little snipes here and there. It's, it's so disingenuous uh, for them to pretend we're talking about the same Jesus. These people do not believe in the historical Jesus that I'm working on refuting. Yeah, you know, on the, on the, that is the focus of the books by myself and by Carrier. We're not talking about the same Jesus. They believe in the Christ of faith, which mainstream scholars, mainstream uh, non-Christian scholars, already reject. We are talking about a completely different character. If there was a historical Jesus and we could actually say some things with certainty about him, he would be a regular person who wasn't divine, who didn't perform any miracles. That is not the person to kickstart the Christian faith. The Christian faith has, has to have a, a sort of magic Jesus. You can have different forms of Christianity. Uh, you're using the title. You're using the title I'm, that I'm trying to uh, write a book with, actually. Uh, what, what was that? A magic, magic Jesus. Oh, the magic Jesus, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can, you can have a, a religion form around just a purely human Jesus, uh, but that would clearly not be the same thing and, and clearly would not be as influential as Christianity. Uh, mainstream Christianity, but you, you, yeah, you definitely can have uh, alternative Christianity. You can even have a Christianity that agrees with what Carrie and I are saying that earliest Christians believed in a celestial Jesus, except Carrie and I don't think that the celestial Jesus existed because we're atheists and we don't believe in the supernatural. <laughs> right. But you could have Christians changing their views and you know, disregarding the gospels or seeing them for the allegories they are and actually believing in the sort of Jesus that we think Paul believed in. So th that's a possibility as well. Okay, now do you agree with Carrier that we probably started with a Jewish Christianity that was then essentially uh, usurped as a Roman Christianity? Pretty, pretty much. I mean, it's it's no secret. I mean, the mainstream scholars will agree that Christianity basically started off as a as a Jewish sect. I think what we need to get out there is the notion that it's actually a lot more Jewish than we think. I take it so far. Um, that I think that Paul shouldn't even be called a Christian. I think Paul should just be viewed as an apocalypticist Jew who happens to think that, that the celestial Messiah is talking to him and is named Jesus. And the reason for this, 
And the reason for why I find the Celestial Jesus theory so compelling and so plausible and so probable is that the earliest, um, the earliest Christians seem to be quite similar to some of the later Jews, if you can call it that, to, to the Jews uh, before Christianity and around the time of nascent Christianity, in, in the sense that there were many Jews that already believed in a celestial Messiah. And this figure went by various names, such as the Son of Man, a title that comes up later in the Gospels. And they, they already believed, some Jews, not, I'm not saying this of all Jews, but some Jews already believed in a celestial Messiah that would come, that would be sacrificed, that would um, defeat the sky demons and save humanity. And if you read Paul, this is the exact, this seems to be the same character we're talking about. It makes sense then that we're not talking about a historical figure because Paul doesn't give us any historical details. The few things he says that links Jesus to the Gospels are said in allegorical, uh, you know, non-literal ways and obviously seems non-historical. And it seems that Paul just believes in the same sort of Jesus that the Apocalypse Jews believed in and other Jews, uh, with the only difference being that now he's actually got the name Jesus. But who knows? Maybe, maybe that name Jesus was actually there before, like you can sort of infer in Philo. Uh, I mean, th there's hypothetical sources that can support our views, I can tell you. But uh, we, don't, we don't rely on them so much. But uh, the only real difference besides that with Paul and, and the Apocalypse Jews before uh, seems to be that now the Messiah has come. The Messiah has had the sacrifice uh, and is, is speaking to Paul through revelation. And what's interesting is that uh, you can glean from Paul that he thinks no one has seen it. You know, he brings up the old Isaiah quote uh. about what, what no eye has seen. And you think, gee, how can he be describing an actual crucifixion that, that literally happened here on earth a few years ago? Plenty of people would have seen it. Why are you saying, why are you hinting that no one has seen it? And why are you uh, so gung-ho about the idea that w we come to know Jesus through people like you that are receiving these revelations? It just makes perfect sense that we're talking about the celestial Messiah that a lot of Jews already believed in and that that is the figure communicating with Paul or that Paul believes that that's the case because we obviously don't think that figure existed. But that is the figure that is apparently communicating with Paul and telling telling Paul that, yes, he, he has died, he's come back, he saved us all, go spread the word. And that explains why Paul seems to know nothing about the Gospels, any similarities between the Gospels and Paul. Think critically, it probably goes the other way. It's the Gospels borrowing from Paul. Excellent. Now, before we go, I wanted to uh, thank Raphael for being the scholar that most helped uh, get New Skeptics off the ground about two years ago. And uh, last year we saw our, our, we saw our viewership uh, go tenfold last year. And I'm going to try to do that again over the next couple of years and uh, yeah. make this a, a real player of a webcast. So cool. th thank you very much, Raphael Lataster. Yeah, thank you very, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to uh, speak a little and explain what's what's the deal with Jesus did not exist. A debate among atheists. Uh, I think it's a worthwhile book. It summarizes a lot of the recent research from both sides on this topic, and uh, it's a popular book. It's pretty accessible. It's loaded with scholarly references, and it's uh, yeah, it only costs a few dollars on Amazon. So I think it's I think it's well worth well worth checking out. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks very much.